Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's amazing the, the level of attendance. Uh, obviously, drought is in everyone's mind, I guess. Um, so uh, I'll quickly go through uh, what Peter said by a statewide level and then talk a little bit about pricing and regulation and how that impacts conservation as a whole. Um, so if you look at California, comparison to the whole US, it's one of the dry, driest states. Uh, we have the high, largest population ninth biggest economy in the world, and also it has, uh, and the population is expected to grow to about 50 million by 2049. So if you compare where our water resources are and where we reside, you can see that there is not much of a correlation. Uh, so the northern part of the state and the eastern part of the state is where the water is. And then you can see that the most of the population lives on the coastal region. And um, then this was possible because we were able to make this happen through an complicated and complex engineering engineered system. We actually, uh, by the time people started uh, moving to California and living here, we were already uh, pretty advanced in making dams and aqueducts and canals. So we actually, instead of Thinking back in time, think about older cities like Paris, like London, like uh, even if you think about DC, people used to live close to the river, water source, wherever that is. By the time we started residing in California, we actually decided, no, we want to live where it's not, where the, where the weather is nice, but why don't we just bring the water to us um, and solve that issue? So uh, engineers, uh, me and one of them, decided that, oh, totally easy. We can engineer our way out of our problem of not living, you know, next to the water source. So this is this is our very very complicated water system in California. It includes a lot of dams, aqueducts, uh, and Peter went through one of them. Obviously, the, the one that brings water to us in San Francisco. So this system, which was engineered, was made based on the assumption that everything is going to stay the same. Um, uh, for those of you who are engineers, or if you're not, the way that these things are designed is that you have some sense of how the natural system is going to work. We think there's this amount of rain, it's gonna, we're going to have this much precipitation, so if we store it like this, then we'll gradually make it down to the, you know, the end users, and then the reservoir is going to, uh, the snowpack is going to hold some of the water, and then that gradually melts, and we'll, we'll manage it through building these systems. But then unfortunately, oh, unfortunately, that those assumptions are not holding anymore. We actually barely had any snow this year, right? I don't know if any of you, um, and some of you might actually go to Tahoe, but really that was the first year I saw Tahoe to be basically gray, brown and white, and all the white was man-made snow. Very limited natural snow on the mountains. Um, so you have the climate change that's basically shifting the snowpack, changing the precipitation type, and the snow is coming later, uh, the, the, the rain is coming later and in the form of a um, precipitation coming in the form of a rain rather than the snow. And then you have population growth, which actually not only within California, but also <coughs> the neighboring states, which we share water resources with. Uh, and then you have the, and then as time goes by, we are realizing that we can't just pollute the water uh, and also we can't just take all the water for humans, so we do not have to share more water with the ecosystem because we are depending on it, as uh, Peter actually mentioned, and also we need to keep the water clean, so there are a lot, of, a lot more restrict uh, red, uh, environmental and ecosystem uh, needs that need, needs to be met. So that all has led into our water resources basically shrinking in a more and becoming more limited while we still need to feed and sort of grow into what we have. And then also our infrastructure is aging. So that's, uh, that's actually poses a big challenge. So as we are dealing with this issue, and now that you're in the fourth year of this drought that we're in, um, what comes to mind is we can do what we used to do forever. So we need to come up with new <coughs> solutions, right? 
we need to have portfolio of solutions. Uh, again, like earlier Matt showed that, that uh, little pie chart that you saw, about 80% of our water is coming uh, from SFUC. So, so imagine that is a big, big chunk of water, right? If, if that source is diversified, if the way that we get water is diversified, then we might have a better chance of you know, rethinking the system we already have, right? So, so, think, um, so in this journey that we're gonna take for the next like five, 10 minutes, I'm gonna actually show you how electricity sector or energy sector did that and how successful they have been in actually changing the mindset of the people, changing the way that the, uh, the, where our electricity is coming from and how they're gonna finance, how they have financed these changes. So, um, as I said, we have to rethink the way we sort of put together our portfolio of solutions. We need to rethink the demand, we need to, uh, you know, be more, conserve more water, and uh, increase the efficiency, and then also rethink our economic priorities, and, and also do more education and outreach. That, that way we can use less water or use the same amount of water for, for more, so increase the protection productivity of our water supplies. This has not been, a, a, you know, this is not a new thing. And Los Angeles, and like, I mean, the Southern California area, and all, actually Bay Area, both, they have been using the same amount of water for the, for the past 30, 40 years, even though the population has been growing. So it's not, an, it's not a very, uh, it's not a brand new idea, it's not something that hasn't been happening, but we need to continue sort of grow within what we have rather than seeking for more. Um, but also we need to rethink supply. As I said, like the water, the supply that we have, 80, 85 percent is coming from uh, sort of imported water into the system. Maybe we should think more about recycled water, rainwater capture, stormwater capture. We are actually in a coastal region, so uh, we have the chance of using these waters without dealing with somebody downstream waiting for that water. So that actually is is quite helpful. <clears throat> and then also governance. Um, the way we manage water. Um, so we have uh, water supply agencies, we have wastewater supply agencies, and then we have, <coughs> I'm sorry, and then you have um, flood protection agencies. So these all are not necessarily connected to each other, they don't work with each other. So if you want to use wastewater and then clean it up and put it in your water system, then you have to sort of have these two people, these two groups talk to each other and work with each other. <laughs> also within that category is like how you price water, how you value the water you get. I want to ask you a question, so how do you know what you're paying for when you're in your water bill? Do you think you're paying for your water, like water as what is in this cup, not the actual cup? We are not paying for that water. That water is for free. What you're paying for is for the services you are receiving. The infrastructure that's there, the people who are going to manage it, clean it, bring it to your house. So you're not paying for the water which means you are not gonna pay for the scarcity or drought or the way that, like, if, if in a, and for the future that you're borrowing this water from. So, so, that's, so that's like a very important thing that basically a lot of people don't realize. People tell me, I'm paying a lot of money for my water. No, you're not paying a lot of money for your water. You pay for the services you receive. <laughs> so, um, so this is your water use cycle. Somebody brings the water from surface water source, groundwater, wherever that water is coming from. Then it comes to the sort of, goes through the conveyance system, makes it to your city or county or water supplier. They treat the water, they distribute it among their users, and then that water after it's used, it's collected, cleaned up, <coughs> put back in the environment, or get recycled and put back in the, gets used again. Um, this part of this whole water use cycle is uh, something that's brand new. We are trying to kind of make it more common to reuse the water more often, but it's certainly a, this, this is how your water use cycle looks like. So a lot of innovation can happen within this water use cycle. We can change many different things. 
this, there are so many boxes here. These are all opportunities. We can take every box and rethink the way we format and we put things in it. So to give you an example, um, we just recently did a study at Stanford, uh, looked at energy sector and how they have changed the way they use and produce energy and how innovative thinking could kind of penetrate it into the energy sector. So this, if you use patent as a proxy, right? So we all have a proxy for innovation. You can see that the green line is the water sector, and then the blue line is energy. And you can see how, how much more patents you had in the energy sector, right? So, so this is obviously shows that they have been a lot more innovative in the way they use water, and the, the way they manage their um, system. So how did they do that? How did they go through this whole growth? One was through pricing. So I made this graph yesterday. I'm going to sort of walk you through it. The left side is the retail price of electricity since 2001 in California. The right side, side shows you how much energy efficiency and conservation has happened in California since that year. Look how closely they, do, they mimic each other. As soon as the price goes up, conservation and efficiency increases. Goes down. The, you can see the other the efficiency and conservation. So it's like it's really amazing how they mimic each other. So we are responding to the price very much. So and then if you correlate the price of electricity and innovation, again using patents as a source, you can see that um, as the price of electricity, this is for the whole entire U.S as the price of electricity has been increasing, as the number of patents has been increasing. So in a more innovation has been happening in the water sector. One of the biggest problems we have right now in the water sector is we are still relying in this old, complicated system that we had and haven't had many innovative thinking sort of penetrating through the way we manage water. Ideas are happening, research is happening, but they don't necessarily make it to the, to this, to the end use and make it to, the, uh, uh, to sort of disseminate to the management parts. So this is another figure that shows the price of water in US in comparison to the price of water in other developed countries in, uh, in relation to the monthly household income. That way you basically normalize it. It's, not, it's much more relevant. So look where U.S. is. So you have United States with this bar line down here. I know there was a... Oh, no. Okay, so this is U.S. And look at this, Denmark, uh, Germany, France, UK. These are all like other developed countries. And look how much more they pay for their water. And they, all, they almost pay like four times more for their water, they use a quarter of the water we use. Part of it is because it's, ur it's a different kind of urbanization setting, right? People don't have big lawns, big like, you know, lots, the houses are not as big, so definitely you see that happening. But then again, also, even in Australia, and, and you can see that even in Australia that they're paying more for the water, they're still using a lot of water just because they also have a very similar <coughs> setting that we have in the US. But price definitely matters. That's, that's a whole conversation. That, and that's the point I'm trying to make here, that it's really important how we price the water in order to, to get the water to be used more efficiently and effectively. Another reason that we have to price the water in a better way is because it's very important in the way we finance the future of our water systems. Um, this was done by the Global Water Intelligent this is so, um, and I apologize for the little things down here. It's, I have a Mac, and I think when you bring them to PC, it kind of something different. Anyway, so this is telecommunication, the first two, and then the gas and electric, and then water. So simple, simplifying this graph. For every three and a half dollars we invest in our water system, we only collect a dollar. Okay? And this is, uh, telecommunication, for every dollar we invest in a system, 
Actually, for every 90 cents we invest in the system, we collect a dollar. So you think these people probably have some money that they can invest in their systems and make it more advanced than if you want your internet to work faster on your phone to work faster, right? Because they have to reinvest in their system. If your system is so complicated and so expensive to build that you have to invest three and a half dollars and only collect a dollar, you're already behind. You already have to pay back for the system that you have. So, so this is this is the reality of your, uh, you know, pricing and how everybody talks about how much you're paying for our water and how expensive it is and all that. Believe me, you're not paying enough. If you compare it to what, how much you're paying for your cell phones and for a lot of other thing, other services that you provide, and also that ends up discouraging people from investing in becoming more efficient and uh, and uh, conserve more water. I give you an example. When we actually bought our place, we had, we invested in uh, insulating our ceiling, replacing our windows, and this is a big investment. But we started saving a lot more on our, on our electricity rate. Like uh, uh, bill, but then imagine I make that investment in water in my water system. Imagine I re I place a um, a great water system in my house. The payback period is going to be a lot longer. I need to be a very committed person who is willing to invest that money and be willing to let that go because it's not you're not going to that system is not going to pay back that fast through the amount of money you're paying for it. So there's a direct relationship between how much you pay for your water and how your system is financed. So price has two sides to it. Um, right now, for the water systems that we have, the way we pay for it, we, we use municipal bonds, state revolving funds, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, you have tax initiatives, and then also public benefits funds. And then uh, there are funding gaps for conservation, for data collection, lack of data, data management, uh, mon uh, the, you know, the research and development, and also kind of bringing the new innovative ideas to market, and um, sort of investing in innovation. So, um, so there's a lot of data gaps. So um, I'm going to quickly go through this because I'm, I'm sure I'm, I have already run out of time. But uh, we did a study. We looked at again energy sector. They have this public goods charge that it was placed in your energy bill which we all paid for. It was about $2 um, uh, per cycle that you're paying for your bill. 1%, about 1%, 2% of your bill. And that actually ended up being used to invest in a lot of those gaps that I was telling you about. They, invest, they used that to uh, invest in R&D, to bring the, down the cost of the like, cost of production and technology. Think about um, uh, solar panels 10 years ago. There were not many houses that had solar panels on top of them. Now solar panel is a name in town, right? Everybody, like every other person in the neighborhood has a solar panel. So, so partly that was driven by the bringing down the cost of them through all these funds and also attract private capital because of them. Um, you can get that report off our website and Athena, who is in the back, she uh, can get your email and send it to you. The third one is regulation. And um, I'll, again, very quickly go through this, and then I'll, I'll be done. Um, when we, electricity sector, one of, the, one of the tricks that they took was one of the things that they did, they said, we're going to have a renewable portfolio. You need to have, make sure certain number of, like, uh, certain uh, amount of your electricity comes from these, re these sources, solar, wind, uh, high, small hydro, so they basically prescribe that you need to go out there and diversify your electricity portfolio. And that's something we should do for water as well. So, so look what happened. As soon as they did that, all of a sudden the market in for the uh, market size for these wind and solar increased significantly. Again, the number of patents that happened in both wind and solar also, also directly is correlated for the market with the market size and they increase significantly. So that basically changed the market very much. Um, this is the same sort of similar thing uh, but in a different way just for California. These are the different programs and appliance standards and building standards that they're put in place to encourage energy efficiency. 
and you can see that as these as, as these uh, sort of programs and appliance standards and building standards were put in place, the amount, the energy efficiency, the level of energy efficiency and conservation increased significantly. So these definitely matter. Regulations matter, price matter, financing matters. Um, so and then through this, you can come up with a more diversified water supply solution that we need to meet our future demand and also to kind of rely less in important water, imported water and uh, look more locally for what we need. And there, I'm gonna close. Thank you.